time for questions and answers. Uh, although um, I think we've had practically every Sunday night uh, to answer some of the questions, several of them uh, taking uh, the full length of our time. And uh, I think we have another one in a couple weeks we're going to do, but we are running out. I think I'm down to three or four. Uh, so if you have more questions, uh, please uh, put them in the box. The first question, we have three we want to deal with tonight. The first question we want to look at is, is calling your child Jesus using the Lord's name in vain? That's an interesting question. Uh, the name Jesus means the same as Joshua in the Old Testament. And according to Strong, both names mean Jehovah is salvation. And uh, you find people with this name in, uh, by, throughout Bible history. Uh, and I don't think anything was intended as being irreverent when they gave those names. The name Hosea just simply means salvation. So uh, many had those names. You find them uh, as you read through the Old Testament. Uh, the thought probably was intended to honor God. And uh, it still might, depending on the motives that uh, parents might have, for naming a child Jesus today, but since the name was specifically given to the Savior, my opinion is that the name ought to be reserved for the Son of God. Uh, imagine being out in public and calling for a lost child and shouting at the top of your lungs the name of Jesus. You'd probably get everybody looking at you uh, and then uh, how awkward is it to say, uh, Jesus, do I need to spank you? I mean, this just doesn't work very well. I would avoid uh, using that for the name of a child. Uh, so it may seem awkward at best, but it mostly seems disrespectful. I don't know how God views it. But uh, those are some thoughts I had on the subject. There are no lack of names. In fact, uh, I seem to hear a new one every day. So <laughs> if you don't like any names that are out there now, make one up. Uh, I think most people are doing that. Uh, so uh, there's no reason to use this particular name that has been come to be associated with salvation with Jesus, with our Lord and Savior. Now, the second question, what excuse will persons who have not heard from the people of God, and I inserted the word have there, uh, because we fail to express the will of God? Well, there are several things to say in uh, answer to this question. First of all, Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, all people are without excuse. Uh, and this is the argument that Paul makes concerning the existence of God. And of course, if you know that God exists, then you have to know that there is something that he wants, and it's our responsibility to seek it. In Romans chapter 1, verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Everyone has a responsibility to ask, where did I come from? How did I get here? Uh, you cannot be a thoughtful human being and not ask that question. And uh, when you ask that question, then you have to determine to answer that question. 
and uh, to seek out God. It should not take long before your search brings you to the scriptures that have answers to the questions that men ask. So, first of all, people are without excuse. However, that's not the end of the situation. Second, those who are ignorant will be punished less than those who knew but disobeyed. You'll recall Jesus talked about being beaten with many stripes versus being beaten with few stripes. The problem is you're still beaten and uh, you don't want to be punished. So it's not going to be a lot of consolation to say I'm not being punished as badly as he is because you're still cut off from God. You're still separated from God as uh, Paul discusses in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. However, to get back to the focus of the question, the church needs the whole counsel of God. I'll get to the other answer in a minute, but this has to precede that. Acts chapter 20 and verse 27. Acts chapter 20 and verse 27. For I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. So those who are members of the body of Christ need the whole counsel of God. What do sinners need? Do they not need to know the gospel? They may not be ready yet for the whole counsel of God. Uh, they first have to be obedient to the gospel. But they need to hear the gospel. Uh, I don't know how we can uh, sit by and uh, just say, well, somebody can do that. No, it's not somebody, it's us. We have to be not only uh, helping those in the church, but also presenting the gospel to those who are not in the church. Do they need to hear about salvation? Do people outside the body of Christ need to hear about salvation? Well, let's take a quick look at what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 22. I know this is familiar to everybody, but it bears repeating. 1 Corinthians 9, 22, the second part, I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some it is the responsibility of those who are children of God now uh, somebody has his own responsibility true we pointed that out in Romans 1 but we also have a responsibility to reach those outside of the body of Christ with the gospel that can save their souls Besides, people not only need to hear the gospel, which is the place to start, but they also need to hear other things, other lies, uh, challenged. And who is going to tell them the truth about moral issues? Planned Parenthood? Is that where they're going to learn what they need to learn? The ACLU? Morgan and Morgan? They'll be wanting to uh, do some marijuana listening to Morgan and Morgan. Uh, the National Organization of Women, some liberal think tank, is this where they're going to find out the truth on moral issues? Where are they going to hear it if not from us? And so, yes, we do have a responsibility. Let's take a look at uh, Mark chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. <laughs> Mark chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. We have a, a very interesting and unusual passage here where, uh, beginning with verse 17, we read that Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his, brother's Philip, uh, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. 
For John had said to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. It is not lawful for you to have your brother, Philip's in this case, his brother. It's not lawful for you to have his wife. Many of our brethren would have never lost their lives like John because they'd have stayed silent. They would not have said anything. They would not have challenged the immorality that exists. And uh, so they would not have lost their lives due to their silence. They would have lost their souls. The people of God have a responsibility to tell people the truth. The truth of the gospel, the truths of God's system of morality. So all are without excuse. Christians cannot, however, be silent. And that brings us now to the third question, which will take a little bit more time. And that regards anointing with oil, as we find it in James 5 and verse 14. The question is, Though this procedure has not been practiced by churches of Christ in modern times as a general rule, some are suggested that it ought to be part of our ritual. How should this matter be viewed? First of all, we do not have a ritual. We do not have rituals. Neither the word rite nor the word ritual in the singular appears in the King James or most other translations. Neither does the word ceremonies, or ceremony rather. And the reason for that is the things that we do have meaning and they are supposed to be filled with thought on the part of the participants. It should not be a ritual to listen to a sermon, although for some it may be. It should not be a ritual to remember the Lord's death as we do each Lord's Day, although for some it may be. Uh, prayer should not be a ritual. Singing should not be a ritual. These things are things that we ought to do out of the joy that we have and the enthusiasm as children of God that we have toward God. They should not simply be something we remotely, automatically do without putting thought and intent into what we are doing. Uh, only once in the entire Bible does rites and ceremonies appear. Numbers chapter 9, verse 3. So let's take a look. Both words appear there and only there throughout the entire Bible. On the 14th day of this month at twilight, you shall keep it at its appointed time. And by the way, it is the Passover, as you see in verses 1 and 2. Uh, according to all its rites and ceremonies, you shall keep it. Now, it's interesting that this is the only time those words appear. And uh, it, it's interesting that they translated it rites and ceremonies because those words are used dozens of other times and never translated that way. Uh, for example, the most common translation for rites, and there are other ones, is statute. And uh, that makes perfect sense, the Passover with all of its statutes. The other word, ceremonies, is usually rendered judgment 296 times. And yet, for some reason, it was decided to use rites and ceremonies. I'm not sure that was the best decision uh, for this particular uh, passage. But that's what was done. However, in Christianity, those words are never used. I, I don't think it was uh, supposed to be a rite or a ceremony. The Passover was to remind them, wasn't it, of how God delivered them out of Egypt? It was not to be something done uh, like an automaton uh, without feeling, without uh, meaning. Uh, the very purpose of it was to recall the meaning of God's delivering them. So the problem with the word ritual is that it often refers uh, 
to something that is done without thinking about the true meaning that is involved in what is being done. God wanted Israel to see the significance of the Sabbath day, the Passover, all of these things every uh, year and every week regarding the Sabbath day. It was not just a ritual. But what about James chapter 5 and verse 13? We find the word oil used in connection with the word anoint only a few times in the New Testament and of course probably much more in the Old Testament. So let's take a look at a uh, passage uh, where that can be found and we find that a guest's head was to be anointed. Let's go to Luke chapter 7 and verse 46. <clears throat> You'll recall that uh, Jesus was invited to this uh, person's uh, house, but he had not treated him very well as a guest. In uh, Luke chapter 7 and verse 46, Jesus, knowing that the host was being critical of him, asked him a few questions and uh, made some statements. One of those is, you did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. He's making a comparison of how the host had been negligent in all of his duties, uh, but this woman had been very attentive because of the great sorrow she had for the sins that she had committed. But in the course of uh, making that comparison, it's called to mind that sometimes a host would anoint uh, a guest's head with oil. It was uh, designed as something that refreshed uh, the individual. And uh, so it was appreciated quite often uh, especially if they had been out and uh, been in uh, dust or uh, just uh, the wind blowing severely through, uh, that, would, that would be a uh, refreshing thing to receive as a guest coming in to someone's home. Now let's go to Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 9 to a passage we talked about this morning in class. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 9, it's mentioned that Jesus is anointed as king. Remember, to follow the text in this, uh, in verse uh, 6, he did not say certain things uh, to angels. And earlier in the text, verse 5 in particular, to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son? Of course, that never happened. But in verse 6, when he be, uh, brought the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, and there's more to follow there, but now notice the contrast in verse 8. But to the Son, he says, and there are two things that follow in verses 8 and 9, and another couple of things that follow in verse 10. All of these things are said to the Son. And to the Son, the Father calls him, O God, in verse 8 and verse 9, and Lord in verse 10. All of these things are addressed to Jesus. But the one that we're looking at right now is you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And so Jesus was exalted above all and anointed with the oil of gladness. Now in the Old Testament, often a king or a prophet might be anointed with oil. And, of course, Jesus is a king. He became a king when he ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of God. So there's, those are two of the passages in which we find anointing with oil used in the New Testament. Let's go to the next one, Mark chapter 6 and verse 13. <clears throat> Mark chapter 6, verse 13. 
Now this is during the limited commission where Jesus is giving them instructions as to what to do. And uh, after he gave them the instructions, they went out, verse 12, and preached that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. They anointed with oil the sick, not as a prophet, not as a king, not as a priest, not to help them physically. The purpose for anointing them was not to help them physically. Notice how it is stated. They anointed with oil the sick and they healed them. The oil had nothing to do with the healing. The apostles uh, were able to bring that about, but it was not brought about with oil. They anointed them first, and then they healed them. Well, why anoint the oil uh, with oil the sick? It may be that it was to announce cleanness. It was to announce and call attention to what they were about to do. Uh, a, a traveler would be refreshed and uh, somewhat cleansed by having his head anointed, as we talked about previously. But in this case, they were cleansed in order to announce wholeness and uh, their ability to return to work. So they are uh, anointed apparently for that reason, but it's not in connection with healing them. Now another passage that we come to is Luke chapter 10 and verse 34. Uh, this one almost everybody knows since it involves uh, the good Samaritan who stopped by to help the beaten man in verse 34. And he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set himself on his own animal and brought him to the inn and took care of him. Uh, in this case, it was medicinal. There are some properties of oil and uh, uh, wine that could be of service, but there was no supernatural healing here. Uh, this good Samaritan didn't have the ability to lay his hands on someone and heal them. So uh, that was only done for uh, physical but not supernatural healing. All right, now we come to James chapter 5 and verse 13 through 16. So let's turn over to that text and try to answer the question, having looked at all this as background material. James chapter 5, verse 13, let's look at it carefully. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing songs. Well, these refer to physical conditions. Is any among you suffering? Now, that would imply some kind of physical malady. Is any among you merry? That's another state, one of happiness. So uh, one is suffering either to uh, poor physical health or possibly because of persecution. So some are merry and uh, they are ready to sing songs. That doesn't mean you can't sing songs if you've been persecuted. As we know from Acts chapter 16 and verse 25 that Paul and Silas had been beaten and we're in stocks and we're praying and singing at midnight. So it doesn't mean, but usually people are more likely to sing if they're happy. Well, uh, either one of those is fine. We understand physical suffering. We understand feeling happy. In fact, Elihu in the book of Job in Job 35.10 talks about having songs in the night. Um, so all of those things we consider. However, when we get to verse 14, 
we're no longer talking about physical things. There is a different emphasis. Uh, the word sick in verse 14 may well refer to one who is spiritually sick, and the elders can help in this case. So let's look at that. Is anyone among you sick? Well, it, if he meant sick spiritually or physically, that would have gone along with verse 13, but this seems to be asked in a different sense. Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Well, is the oil to help him physically? Apparently not. And then he goes on to say in verse 15, And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up, as he have commi uh, remitted, uh, con committed sins, uh, he will be forgiven. And just to add a little emphasis to then, he goes on to say, confess your faults or trespasses one to another and pray one for another. So in verses 14 through 16, we seem to have the idea of being spiritually sick. Verse 13, yeah, probably physically sick, but not in verses 14 through 16. Now, one brother suggested that the oil in this passage represents the word of truth. You know, I really like that idea, but I can't find it anywhere. Uh, it's one of those things that, oh, yeah, I like that. That makes sense, you know. But I can't find anywhere where oil refers to the word of truth. There may be a passage in uh, Psalms or someplace, but I, I can't put my finger on it. More likely, the oil is to indicate spiritual recovery just as it does physical recovery in Mark 6.13. In other words, uh, in Mark 6, they anointed with oil and then they had the physical recovery. In this passage, we have the anointing of oil and therefore we have the spiritual recovery. So that seems to make the most sense, although there are a number of interpretations of this passage. Well, uh, somebody might ask, well, why can't it be physical health? Well, because everything in verses 14 through 16 seems to be spiritual. The prayer of faith will save the sick. His sin will be forgiven. And uh, then we should all be encouraged to confess our uh, trespasses one to another and to pray for one, uh, one for another, and here's an example of a, a man who was just like we are, and he prayed, and look what he accomplished with his prayer. And so don't underestimate the power of prayer. This is why we have it, and this is why we use it for the benefit of one another. Now, there's still a question. Why don't we do it? Well, it's not the custom of the society in which we live, for the most part. Um, you've probably seen some presidential inaugurations. Have you ever seen one anointed with oil? No, not in this country. Governors, no, same thing. We don't see them anointed with oil. It's just simply not the custom uh, in this part of the world. It may be in some other parts of the world, but not here. We don't anoint travelers. We don't use oil uh, if someone is suffering physically, as was done with the man who was beaten. We use medicines. And uh, so it's a matter of uh, this, is, this is not the way we have done things for centuries. In fact, we've never done that at all in this country, to my knowledge. Another thing is, this is the only time it's mentioned in the New Testament where it was the custom of the Jews of the dispersion. So this was something that was customarily done in pr uh, praying uh, for those spiritually sick, but it's not something that we do today, and it's not something that is common today. It is uh, the case that elders need to pray for those who are struggling with sin, and so that's the part 
that we have maintained and which we continue to do. Well, there are many people who are struggling with sin, and we certainly do need to pray one for another. We have many, and some even here, that uh, do not return to be encouraged by all of you on Sunday evening. Many of them used to, but they're no longer doing that. We need to pray for them. We need to talk to them about it and see if that, that uh, former uh, ardor could be reheated a little bit. People are struggling with sin. If you're not reading the Bible, sin is keeping you from doing that. Satan is keeping you from doing that. If anybody is not attending worship as they should, who's keeping them from doing that? God's not. And so it is Satan. So there are people that may be struggling with sin. We may not know all, what all those struggles are, but uh, we're brethren and we need to help work through those things and help those who are struggling with sin, remembering that the prayer of a righteous person avails much. This evening, if there is anyone who has not yet put on the Lord Jesus Christ in baptism and you've studied and you know what you need to do, we're ready to assist you if you're willing to repent of your sins. Or if you're already a child of God, maybe you've been struggling with sin. Is there a way we can help you? Let us know while we stand and while we sing.